far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory, but let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. We've read from the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians in preparation for this morning's exhortation entitled Peter's Sword, Part 2, to be presented by our brother Gary Hoagland. Brother Gary. the new podium. I don't remember this here. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, recap part one. And this uh, whole idea of Peter's sword and uh, the talk of uh, part two was, should we defend ourselves? Should we be able to if something's happening. So that was the, the question. It was um, brought to my attention by my mother when we were discussing this, that we should have all our trust in the Lord and pretty much shouldn't have to worry about defending ourselves. So that's, that's one, one point of view. And we're going to talk about recapping uh, some of the murders that happen in the Bible through the scripture. We discussed Cain and Abel. Everybody's familiar with that. And the Lord had talked to Cain and said, think about what you're, you're doing. The Lord knew what was going on. The Lord knew he was jealous. He was angry that his sacrifice was not being acceptable. And he didn't like that. So he plotted murder, and he carried that murder out, out in the field. Let's go out to the field. Let's go have a little walk. And he killed his brother. That's the first recorded murder. It was planned. And something that came out with all the, uh, I'm going to just recap the Illinois statutes on murder. Most of us think of first degree murder as a cold, calculated act and an intentional slaying committed with malice, a forethought, thinking it out. Illinois law on homicide says this, a person who kills an individual without lawful justification, so I'm don't know how it's lawful to kill somebody, I guess, if they're breaking into your uh, house or apartment. If in performing the acts which cause the death, he either intends to kill or do greatly, great bodily harm to that individual or another, or knows that such an act will cause death to that individual or another, or he knows that such acts create a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to that individual or another, and this is section blah, 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 and it goes on and on, but that gives you the gist of the Illinois law on murder, which they didn't have back in uh, the book of Genesis. <clears throat> so we found out, too, that as they teach you in martial arts, anybody can be had. They teach you that. And Abel certainly was had. That means he most likely didn't see it coming probably had his neck sliced. Uh, the next murder we had talked about was Moses when he 
murdered the Egyptian. Now that, I don't think, would go with our Illinois statutes and laws. I don't think that was pre-planned. It was uh, spur of the moment. He thought it was his time to lead uh, the Hebrews out of there. It was not his time. It was uh, to be 40 more years. And they uh, had said something to him. Who made you, when he uh, encountered another fight between the Hebrews, and who made you ruler and judge over us? And that was a prediction to be fulfilled 40 years later. And another thing I thought about this with the killing of the Egyptian, there was no, not many comments on this from, uh, in the scriptures. Was that also a prediction of the future of future Egyptians that would be killed? The firstborn and the slaying of the Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. But all in all, it was, uh, this was murder, not premeditated, though. And then we talked about David. Not only did he commit murder, but adultery. And he committed the murder to hide the adultery, to hide his sin. And we get a lot more information in the uh, books of 2 Samuel, than we do on the Cain and Abel murder, or even the murder of uh, the Egyptian. David had to get rid of Uriah, and Uriah was one of the mighty men, and Uriah started with the mighty men well before David's time. He started with Saul. And I didn't mention before, but the mighty men aren't called mighty men for nothing. These are powerful warriors that can take out 300 people at a time by themselves. So David had to get rid of this guy, and he planned it, and he schemed it, and never did he ask for God's help in what had happened. We found out also that in the Proverbs, Solomon wrote some interesting things on what I believe that David had done. And uh, I think he helped him record these things. And it was a uh, book of Proverbs in chapter 5 and 6. There's warning against adultery in the first few verses. There's warning against the lying tongue which David did, the hands that shed innocent blood, which David did, a heart that de devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, and a false witness who pours out lies. You know, David committed murder. He not only won, uh, got rid of... Uh, Uriah the Hittite, but many others died when they pulled back from the wall. So more than one man was murdered, so there were so many sins going on, it was not good. This was premeditated murder. This was at the heart that devises wicked schemes. Nathan said to David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah. And in uh, 2 Samuel 12, David is told, you did this, you did it in secret but the things I'm going to do to you will be in broad daylight for everybody to see. And that's an interesting point to consider and to reflect upon. What if all of our dirty secret, secrets were brought out into the broad daylight for everyone to see?
So how many of these people had a chance to defend themselves? Should we defend ourselves? That's the question I'm going to try to answer today. <coughs> David lost it. Instead of turning to God for help, he turned to himself. And that wasn't good. It didn't work out good. There are still so many murders and awful things going on in the world, in different parts of the world. There was a video on ISIS or ISIL, and that stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, and it's just one of the extremist groups over there. If, uh, Israel is surrounded by them. Now whether this video was true or not, I didn't watch the whole thing. But it was the mass beheading of the 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians living in Libya. The persons that were talking and commenting on this subject, he raised this very question. Well, these guys were all tied behind their back, made to kneel down by the ocean there. This guy, this commentator who was viewing this and sharing the video, he could not believe that these 21 Christians that were tied up, he couldn't believe that they didn't even try to fight back. These ISIS murderers, they were a head and shoulder taller than all of the captives. And they had them on their knees with their hands tied behind their back. He's like, the commentator said, well, you could kick them. You could try to kick and run for the ocean, do something. I didn't watch the part where all the beheadings took place. And this is going on more and more and more with the knives and the swords coming out in more and more different countries. So I would say it's a little easier to defend yourself against a knife or a sword than uh, bullets. We've probably all heard the expression, fight or flight. Well, maybe they could have done a little fight and then a little flight into the ocean. They probably wouldn't have gotten very far, but myself, I might have tried to get away. I don't think God would judge us too harshly for trying to get away and save our life from a bunch of maniac killers. So this is different than when they come in, as they do with the uh, semi-automatic rifles and machine guns and they just spray bullets around and try to kill as many people as they can kill. You don't get much of a fight in there. At best, uh, in that circumstance, is the best for us would be the flight or hide. <clears throat> and we remember what's said a lot in John 15, 13, Maybe in those instances to think about this. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Another interesting thing I got out of the paper a while ago. The Christian church-going people in some of the uh, Middle Eastern countries are tired of getting shot up. And they are starting their own Christian militias. They're going to fight back. Now that, I'm not advocating that. I'm not going to read this article. But I don't think that's what Christ is telling us, to fight back and to kill. To murder. What 
what really got me interested in this subject, besides the fact that we were talking about is it okay to defend yourselves, and I was asked that, was Peter and the sword, Peter with the sword. I wondered, Peter and the sword, why does Peter need the sword? You're going around with Jesus, And when all that was uh, going on, I, I never realized that other disciples had swords with them too. They carried these uh, swords for protection from the bandits. So we don't know how many of the 12 were armed and the instance that led up to that was Jesus' betrayal. That's in Luke 22, 49. They asked Jesus, should we strike with our swords? I always thought it was just Peter and his sword, but Maybe they were all armed. Maybe a few of the disciples were armed. They could have fought. Maybe they thought that was their time to fight. And Jesus said, no. John 18, 3. So Judas came to the grave guiding a detachment of soldiers, some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And it's only from John that we know that it was Peter who drew his sword. That's in John 18, 10. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And we saw that in the Christmas play here this last uh, December with Sue's class, I believe. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And again, it's interesting, because in the middle of the Gospels, the middle chapter, when Jesus is sending out the disciples and he sent out the 72 ahead of them to the different towns, they were just to take their cloak and the sandals and nothing, nothing's mentioned about the sword, them carrying their swords when they were sent out. Now, this time they, they've all got swords again. So. so Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. And maybe Peter was remembering this, uh, John 15 again. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So he was going to lay down his life for Jesus if need be. Peter might have been thinking, okay, this is it. This is the time. But Jesus says, no, this is not the time. And this is not the way it's going to be done. And another interesting thing I found in the reading, Jesus doesn't tell anybody to get rid of their swords. At this time, he says, put them away, put them back in the sheath. Peter was defending Jesus and their group. He was going to lay down his life if he needed to, which we found out, find out later on that he wasn't really quite ready to lay down his life. Now why do we say, or why do I say that he was going to lay down his life? In Matthew 26, 47. One of the twelve arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with the swords and clubs. So Peter was either relying on his sword here or another miracle from Jesus. They'd certainly seen enough miracles. Or the help from the others who had swords. In Matthew, Jesus tells Peter again, put your sword back in its place. Don't get rid of it. Put it back. He also says, 
For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Jesus could have called upon 12 legions of angels. He didn't need Peter and the others' swords. Then I got to thinking, and once you start going into all this kind of stuff, looking for weapons and in the Bible and, and uh, defending yourself in the Bible, there's not a whole lot in there. Like in, even in the Young's Concordance, not a whole lot on it. So I'm like thinking, where did the disciples get these swords from? I did a little bit of, uh, got to get that note back up here. Research from that time period. And the thinking is that it's most likely would have been what they call a short sword. <clears throat> and there's different, uh, on what sources you go, to how long this sword is. Some say between 20 and 24 inches. Some sources 24 to 27 inches. And this is what the Romans, the Roman army was using at this time. So I'm thinking maybe the disciples were able to get used swords on the cheap for defense, because you know certainly they didn't have a lot of money. And this is the newer sword that came out that the Romans were using. It is gladius, it's called. It's the general Latin word for sword in the Roman Republic. And just go through a little bit of history on it. I just, uh, since this is their offensive and defensive weapon, the term gladius and um, his Panias, Spanish sword, refers to the short sword. And it was used by the Roman legionnaires from the third century BC. It went through several different designs. And up to this, uh, the latest design at this time period when Jesus was there. And it was due to the uh, ongoing campaigns against Hannibal across the Iberian Peninsula, the Roman general, Scipio Ephraenus, became very familiar with the Spanish short sword. It wasn't something they made on site. It wasn't something they made in the area. They had to go by boat or whatever. That this sword was so respected that the Romans wanted it. It was a new design. He wanted to arm all the legionnaires with it, the, the most modern weapon out there. So the Roman army shortly then fielded the short sword of the Spanish origins or the, the gladius. And we're told that it was probably a short sword that Peter and the others were using. And this sword was interesting because it was, it was better. It was a strong sword constructed of Toledo steel. And why is it called Toledo steel? Anybody know? Somebody might know it there. Check. Made in Toledo. Made in Toledo. <laughs> That's right. And that is not in the USA. It was a stronger design, stronger metal. It was better than the common iron or bronze work that they had of the time. It was forged in such a way as to make it virtually indestructible, almost unbreakable. And the good thing about this sword, it had sharp edges, double-edged. You could kill going both ways now. It was good for both the stabbing and the slashing as opposed to the early designs that were only able to do one action or the other. And today, they're stabbing and slashing going on. The Palestinian people are being told, go out and 
stab and kill the Israelis. Do whatever it takes, kill how many you can. They're, they can sneak the knives and stuff in easier than they can the guns, I guess. And it's happening everywhere. That's spreading everywhere. So this weapon led to the ultimate destruction of the Macedonian troops pretty uh, gruesome here, but we see it in the news all the time. And the destruction of the troops with the severed arms, legs, and the heads strewn all about the battlefields. And this does sound like what's going on today still. The training to use the sword was a daily routine. They doubled the weight of the sword and they had to work hours upon the dummies with practicing. And you know what that's like? You double the weight of something, then when you get the real whatever it is in your hand, it's, it's easier, easier to work with. That was their endurance training. So this historically known weapon was made in Toledo, Spain. It was the steel working center since 500 BC. The only other people that could uh, compete with that were the Swedish people with how they made the steel. That's the history of the sword. That's my best guess of where Peter got the sword. Maybe they had the old fashioned only one, one edge to kill you with sword. Do we think, or do I think Peter was trying to cut off someone's ear? No, I don't think he was trying to cut off his ear. I think he wanted to put that guy down and take out as many people as he could. Peter was impulsive. Remember Peter uh, getting out of the boat to walk on the water? Did the other disciples try to do that? Remember Peter telling Jesus that that wasn't going to happen to him in Matthew 16? That's not going to happen to you. Don't say that. From that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. They didn't understand this. Peter says, though, this shall never happen to you. So it makes sense that Peter's the first, the first, and he's the first to draw the sword and try to defend the Lord. So is it all right to defend ourselves? Some say no. I would say at this point that if you don't commit murder and you can slow somebody coming down at you with a sword or a knife, I would try to defend myself or my family. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament again. This is uh, in chapter 9 of Genesis. God's covenant with Noah. It's interesting. Before the flood, there was... Um, the animals had no fear of man, and man was not supposed to eat the animals, so that might be why they weren't afraid of man at that time. But after this time, the fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all of the birds and every creature that moves along the ground. 
Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Doesn't that sound familiar with what Jesus said? If you want to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. For in the image of God has God made man. We know the, we're familiar with the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. Accidents happen. And we read about Peter wanting to lay down his life for Jesus. Look at that again real quick. It's in John 13. Starting at verse 36. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. What does that mean? Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Again, he says, I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Jesus knows it's not time yet. It's not the time. I tell you the truth before the rooster crows and you you will disown me three times. So impulsive Peter. Again, Jesus speaking to uh, his disciples in chapter 16 of John. Verses 1 to 4. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming. This is interesting. Probably we can read over this stuff so fast, so many times. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you, they're being warned already by Jesus. So for when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Jesus goes on to say, I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. So a little prelude to what the disciples would have to endure and maybe a little prelude to what we will have to endure in these end days with uh, things becoming more and more violent and spreading all across the world. And from our reading this morning that Brother Chuck read, Interesting what Paul says about what our weapons should be. This is Paul's defense. And Paul's defense of what? His defense of his ministry. In the first couple of verses, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid, when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold, 
as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Good point for us. We certainly don't want to live by the standards of this world. This world is not getting better. The United States is not getting better. We are, we are told to think that everything is right. If we don't think that everything is right, with all the sin that is going on, then we're haters, or we're bigoted, we're prejudiced. Well, I think as a Christian, we need to be. And not live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments. Who is another person? I'll conclude with this person that got murdered. A person that did nothing wrong. And he was murdered by his own people. It's in Luke 23. We find out that Herod found no fault with Jesus. We find out that Pilate found no fault with Jesus. He wanted him released. They thought they could just punish him, punish him, flog him, make him bleed and suffer, and that would be enough for the people. But no, not the Jews. They had to rile up all the masses. They released a murderer instead of Jesus, who never did anything wrong other than helping people, healing people, teaching them spirituality and the higher things in life. Interesting, too, in this chapter that uh, after all that went on with Jesus, we're told that Pilate and Herod became friends after that time. Read from verse 13. When Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him, then release him. This goes on three times. I will punish him. No, no, no. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him, or murder him. Torture him and murder him. We don't want him. I'm thinking, too, where were all the people that Jesus had healed and saved from their afflictions? Were they in these crowds and not... And were they not here? Were these Pharisees and Sadducees shutting them up? Because we know they, they were the ones riling up these crowds. So for the third time he goes, why, what crime has this man committed? There are no grounds for death. There are no grounds for death. No, give us the murderer, killer, the, uh, the rioter man. We'll take him, crucify Jesus. So they insistently demanded that he be crucified. Huh? Pilate washes his hands of this and releases the man who had been thrown into prison, the murderer, who we only know that he was a murderer from one of the other chapters, and he surrenders to their will. I think that was the ultimate murder in the Bible. 
There are many others. We didn't cover all of them. Is it all right to defend yourself? Jesus didn't. He could have called down legions of angels to defend himself, but he had a, he had a mission and a goal. Should we be more like Jesus? Yes. Should we defend ourselves with the scriptures? Yes. Should we defend ourselves with the sword? That's for each of us to think about. I still can't give you an answer on that one. <laughs>